All right. Hello and good day, everyone. I'm Mojwal Gadaraju, an assistant professor at the WISC Group at the Faculty of Computer Science, uh, Electronics and Mathematics. I'm also a director of the Design and Scale Delft AI Lab, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the third edition of the Academic Fringe Festival on Designing at Scale with Human AI Collaboration. We can harness unprecedented amounts of data using AI today, creating opportunities to tackle major societal problems across a numerous number of domains, such as health, well-being, mobility, you name it. To make AI useful though, we need to find new ways to combine the creative power of humans with the analytical capabilities of computers. While developing and designing solutions and systems for social good, a key challenge lies in finding out how to help designers and experts and other societal stakeholders and working together with AI to prepare, realize, and evaluate design interventions. How can we reduce the design complexity for large scale social interventions? Well, through the course of this edition of the Academic French Festival, we have been discussing these interesting breeds of questions with a number of experts across different fields. We kicked this off with Ben Schneiderman. We went on to have brilliant discussions with Chen Hao Tan and Jiho Ho Kim, as well as Aaron Hafaker, and very recently with Nithya Sambasivan. And we've had many intriguing discussions on human-centered AI. This week, I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker in the series, Trivik Verma, who will talk to us about designing equitable cities at scale. I've had the good fortune of getting to know Dr. Verma over the last decade or so, and I bear witness to his growing passion to tackle various challenges pertaining to urbanization in an equitable and just manner. Trivik Verma is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Technology, Policy and Management in Delphi University of Technology. He leads the Center for Urban Science and Policy at the Department of Multi-Actor Systems and also happens to be the director of the TPAM AI Lab. He's an active member of the Dutch Network Science Community and the 4TU Center for Resilience Engineering. And he's one of the first names that comes to mind whenever I come across the word resilience. Uh, he keeps bringing that up in many of our conversations and has many wise things to say about it. So well, without talking about many of the other accomplishments that you're sure to find if you look up to Trivik, I'll just pass this over to him and try and make best use of this time. Thanks again, Trivik, for taking this uh, invitation up and showing up here to share some of your interesting ideas with us. And I can't wait to hear what you have to share with us today. Thank you so much, which well, that was a wonderful intro. I don't think I can match that. Um, so I'm just going to dive straight into the topic um, and just for, um, the sake of reiterating it. I'm Trivik Verma and I work at uh, the TPM faculty at TU Delft. Thanks again for having me here. Uh, when you talk to me about talking about design uh, and cities and designing at scale, it came to mind that it might be impossible to design cities at scale, but still let's try and talk about it in a manner that I can make a point about how to do that. And so here's my point. Uh, to design at scale, we need to do integrated urban planning. And right now, planning is not integrated. It's it's quite fragmented. So I'm going to make a case for that today. And, and hopefully, we can have a discussion about what you think um, as well. So moving on, I will be talking about four things specifically. Uh, first, I'll introduce what urban inequalities are, how they exist, where, why, and so on. Uh, then I will lead you through an example of accessibility uh, and how that relates to inequalities as an example of how urban planning is fragmented and needs to be more integrated. Uh, that leads us to talking about a more social spatial framework and perspective uh, as a path forward for integrated planning and policy. And finally, I'll end with uh, concluding how we can use knowledge from citizens and, and combine AI and citizen approaches to work towards an integrated policy and planning in cities. So, Urban inequalities exist all around us. They manifest in space. Um, here you can see in this beautiful yet very tragic imagery by Johnny Miller that it's possible to capture inequalities uh, from space. And it's very easy to quantify that, just visually seeing how inequalities arise from different parts of the world. Um, most of us have experiences pro probably of inequalities in our own homes uh, among the various demographics that we live with or within our neighborhoods, seeing how our neighborhoods change uh, when we walk around, or in our traveling and mobility behavior, uh, depending on access to resources and services that we see or have the, the ability to, to use. So inequalities exist everywhere and all around us, and they are uh, perpetuating and multiplying as we go into the future. In 
parallel or because of various other problems in the world, uh, various stressors that cities face, whether it's due to climate change, rising seas, forced displacement of people and communities, and economic inefficiencies built into our system, a lot of uh, cities are facing huge energy demand uh, and a demand for various kinds of resources that are necessary to sustain these populations that are moving into cities. So as we move forward, about uh, estimates say about 80% of the world will be living in cities by about 2050. Maybe you've heard of those estimates slightly in dif different capacities, but as more and more people come into cities, we need to rethink urban spaces so as not to perpetuate more urban inequalities uh, through various problems that are compounding together. <clears throat> so let's look at how governance is done right now and, and what are the challenges that we need to address as we go forward. The first thing is that most policies are implemented without considering the relationships and complexities in an urban system. So at the bottom of this uh, image, you see policies are mostly disintegrated. They don't talk about competing goals and priorities of different stakeholders and different communities for which policies are directed at. Uh, many policies are also focusing on this utilitarian nature of um, benefits will trickle down or be absorbed by communities somehow on their own, uh, which means one solution fits all kind of approach, but benefits are not accrued to society um, as a whole, and they don't consider underlying disparities. So these inefficiencies that come as a result of these user policies are never accounted for in decision making. Then policies thirdly are also neoliberal in nature, um, more so than are appreciated by communities and cities. Planners are often interested in bringing in new and large forms of investment, which are mostly for attracting white collar workers who are highly educated, who want to consume more amenities, who want to live in expensive and good suburbs or neighborhoods in the city center where you have access to a lot of good amenities. But those are not the only people that live in cities. There are also uh, differently skilled workers that exist and cannot afford all of these, these uh, resources and amenities. So these are the three kinds of major problems in cities where planning is focused on neoliberal, utilitarian and disintegrated uh, nature of thinking. Now, credit to this company, uh, whatever they do, they're called KSB Pumps. They created this image saying that they want to see the future as a completely connected AI-based smart infrastructure system where uh, all the pumps are connected to every place in the city and then flow of energy, water, and, and so on will work seamlessly. Now, whatever this image was, was uh, developed, keeping in mind the, the ideas for the company itself, I use it as a metaphor here. So you, on the left, you can see that their idea of a completely connected society in the future is, is nicely functioning. Everything is completely connected. Energy is being developed in a renewable manner in the sea. Uh, you have ports for migration and, and travel. You see land use is connected, transport, everything fully connected. In the middle, you see that all of these connections lead to the center of the city where you have high rises and, and densified neighborhoods. But on the right, metaphorically speaking, there's a community that does not have access to these complete connections. So I, I want to point out here that if we go in the same way as we are with these utilitarian disintegrated policy making approaches, then this is one of the futures that we might be looking at, where for a select few, everything works perfectly and, and well connected, uh, whether AI is used or not. And for many uh, people in the society, many communities, the future is like it's on the right side, where they are subjugated to less access and pushed on the frontiers of, of our cities or urban regions. <clears throat> now, a lot of this could be because our policies are unaware or do not acknowledge that cities are complex. That design is often done in a disintegrated and secluded or single sectoral manner. But cities are complex. We know that from a variety of different fields. They are problems of organized complexity. Jane Jacobs, one of the famous planners in, in American history, wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities in 1961, uh, making a case that in cities we are dealing simultaneously with a lot of relational aspects among different subsystems that exist to make the city fully functional into an organic whole. So on the left you see an example of how cities can be divided into various subsystems and how they are connected and interact with each other. On the top, of course, there are governance networks where you have the state, labor, industries, and NGO 
uh, coming together to work towards policy making. In the middle, you have the urban infrastructure and farm, uh, where all the buildings, utilities, green space, uh, financial capabilities, transportation, energy supplies are present as, as an access, as a resource for the city to use. In the middle, just above that, you have the network, material, and energy flows. So based on this infrastructure, all of the different commodities, goods, services, knowledge, information is moving around the city. And at the bottom, there is more the manifestation of the socioeconomic dynamics that, it, that occur because of the distributional and variable nature of this infrastructure and the flows, and of course, the policy making. So at the bottom layer, it's not just the socioeconomic dynamics that manifest somehow because of the relational nature of these systems, but also because uh, of the reaction of citizens. Citizens are also well, perfectly capable of thinking on their own and, and moving about navigating these complexities of cities in daily life. So they also react to these situations and, and move away from certain neighborhoods or seek certain other neighborhoods or jobs and skills. And so a lot of these complexities are never taken into account when policy is made, um, especially because the nature of policy is, is is focused on the nature of politics, which is four, six, or eight years long, depending on who's in power. So not going too deep into the politics of things, policies are unaware of the inequalities and does not acknowledge the complexity. Uh, but now we also know that urban inequalities is a complex and multifaceted problem. Uh, the focus on the studies of inequalities has so far been economic in nature or related to income and wealth, but not other factors. And now more and more studies are showing us that inequalities exist also across this other socio-demographic and economic variables. And a lot of that is really in relation to lack of access and lack of good opportunities across the board, across all the essential urban infrastructure on the right side that you see, whether it's good public health, good uh, education facilities or outcomes for people, good community support, social support, better food choices, um, healthy food choices, and active lifestyles and green space, of course. So inequalities exist not necessarily because of less access. It's a vicious problem that the scholars are still trying to understand, but definitely associated with lack of access and opportunities for a lot of communities. So when we try to redress these problems or uh, remedy the consequences in the future, how should planners now start thinking about policy making? So this is the question that we asked ourselves at the beginning of, uh, I think a few years ago when we started Center for Urban Science and Policy, is how do we identify and compare these inequalities in access in a spatial manner, try to understand the complex uh, nature, the multi-dimensional nature, so that we can start thinking about addressing this problem from a policy standpoint. So that leads me to the, to the second part of the talk where I'm going to guide you through an example of accessibility and what we learned so far. In accessibility studies, we, we can do this for any part of the world or any city in the world, but I'm going to guide you just using an example of Chicago, uh, which is also a, a famous place for urban science and, and policy, where, which was kind of a city where urban science and policy um, took form and shape in, in the research community. So question for us is how do we identify and compare inequalities in access to urban infrastructure spatially? And the first thing we do is we define accessibility. So here we define it uh, just a choice for our research as an active accessibility score. So we don't worry about going further away in the city, just what can you access from your neighborhood or from your place of residence in a walking, cycling, or um, using an alternate active form of mobility? What can you access in that period? So we calculate the walking distance to an amenity of interest and its attractiveness to a resident using open street maps data, which is fully uh, freely available for, for almost the entire world with certain degree of accuracy and use some theories from net network analysis and some tools from network analysis to calculate a score of active accessibility. The categories of amenities are ranging from mobility, active living, education, all the way to entertainment, which includes also nightlife, restaurants, etc. And uh, what we do here to calculate that is to show uh, is to first divide the whole city into spatial units that are the same size. So on the right side, you see that the spatial units we use are hexagons. We can also use squares. Uh, there are certain reasons to choose one over the other. 
we can talk about that later, but essentially the city is divided into equally uh, spaced hexagons where each hexagon has obviously this inter intersection of the streets and, and nodes where the street network intersects with the hexagons. The green dots are all the intersections where we assume people are going to, to go from their home and then find access to a certain amenity of type C, which is in red. So we calculate the nearest or the shortest distance on this street network to each of those amenities. And below you see the equation D equal to summation of all of these distances, which is a weighted sum of, of the, the distance to each of the nearest amenity using a score that we attribute to the amenity itself. So you can think of that as close shortest distance to type mobility, shortest distance to type uh, active lifestyle, shortest distance to type park, to type entertainment and so on. And each of these types is given an attractive score because mobility is not as important as a bar for all communities and especially overall as a society also, mobility infrastructure is much more important than having a, a bar or a restaurant in your vicinity so that you can move about and, and get a job. So we calculate this by using a weighted uh, sum approach and then take the log of that because the distances are highly varying in a city and subtract it from one. And you see the accessibility score somewhere between zero and one. And in Chicago, it's clear that this score is, is quite segregated. In the north uh, of the city, you see it's very yellow, high access to all of these hexagons. So if you're living in that part of the city, you have good access to all of these amenities. If you're living in the south of the city, or in, in the west somewhere, northwest, then there are black colors associated with the hexagons where the access is quite poor. So naturally we asked ourselves a question, who are these people living in, in this yellow region? Or who are these people living in this uh, black or dark region? And also of course the other regions. <clears throat> so our next method is about social group clustering. We use census data from Chicago uh, and use a methodology called consensus clustering, where we identify groups of households that are closely related in their demographic and socioeconomic attributes with each other. Uh, the census variables are spanning the types of mode choice that people use, their income, education, rent, ratio of minorities, their, uh, the, uh, the quality of their education and so on. So there are in about 44 variables that we use. I haven't listed all of them, but essentially we got some clusters of our social groups here uh, without specifying anything to the algorithm about where they are. And we find that there is a social group on the left side that's quite visually appealing to connect with the, social, the accessibility group on the right side of this image. So there is segregation of urban accessibility and there is only the social group that has specific attributes are also associated with high accessibility and social groups that have uh, a, another set of specific attributes are associated with low accessibility. So what is the nature of these social groups? We look at two here in this plot, uh, the most disadvantaged group and the least disadvantaged group. You see I mapped horizontally the, the accessibility score of each of the hexagons and the two distributions of these groups, where on the left is less accessible and on the right is more accessible. And the most disadvantaged group is a flatter distribution. The median is slightly towards the left, whereas the least disadvantaged group is a skewed distribution with the median towards the right. The least disadvantaged group is characterized by high incomes. They have low ratio of visible minorities, so mostly white folks living in these regions because this is the US, um, they have very good education outcomes and they pay high rent or more choice is either using uh, cars or personal vehicles or public transport, which exists in Chicago in this, in this region. The most disadvantaged group is on the other hand, characterized by low income, low ratio, high ratio of visible minorities. A lot of folks who are from different communities, um, they have low education and low education outcomes and also high unemployment. Uh, in their communities. So these two are very different groups from each other. And that's why we name them as most or least disadvantaged, socially speaking. And their accessibility scores are also quite varying. When we divide the scores of other outcomes for them within their socioeconomic variables, then you see everything is pretty much in stark contrast. So accessibility we already saw is one is uh, less and the other is more. Education levels are completely opposite of each other minority population uh, also, and median income as well. So 
just looking at these plots, we can conclude that the two groups that are diametrically on the other side of the spectrum of vulnerability also have differences in level of, of access. So we did this analysis a bit more deeply. Um, we did this analysis for 10 cities and we found that there's some structural inequalities among populations that are the most disadvantaged. It's not just an artifact of Chicago because of other kinds of uh, infrastructure availability or policy choices that they might have made. Um, at the bottom, you see the box plot that shows high income white people have more accessibility compared to low income minorities. There's also an outlier, not an outlier strictly speaking, but just an artifact of the model where median income white suburban population has the lowest accessibility. And that might be related to just people choosing to live outside the city because uh, of the nature of suburban phenomena in the US cities. We repeated this analysis for 10 cities in the US. And we found that uh, out of the 10, six have quite stark differences in, in inequalities. So you see the accessibility or the average accessibility for these six cities, the median accessibility, sorry, is quite high and, and positive in terms of most disadvantaged groups have lower compared to least disadvantaged groups. In some cities, this is also the opposite, but the differences are not that high. Um, so we found that for 10 cities and we're scaling up the analysis now also for uh, European cities and, and trying to get similar kinds of data sets for cities in Africa, Brazil, India, uh, Australia and China. It's slightly difficult to do that because of not having open source data collected properly over the years through census uh, mechanisms, but we're still trying to do that. Um, but here our conclusion is that we found structural inequalities present in accessibility to a diverse range of infrastructure across 10 highly uh, urban cities in, in the US. So we are, we've de designed an open source architecture to measure and compare access to urban infrastructure. Uh, as you can see, we can do that for any city as long as the data is available um, by doing some contextual analysis of what kind of variables we should select for this analysis, but essentially it's possible to do everywhere in the world. And the question that follows is, uh, so just coming back to the example of Chicago, there's been a lot of development there over the years. And now there, there's sort of this project going on in the last few years, I think where they were trying to develop or expand their, the services for public transit. So question is, how can we provide more livable and accessible spaces to people? And at the time, uh, just in this example and the articles that were coming out at the time about this kind of development in Chicago, the development was focused on a central line that would take people to the airport. So again, it was focused on more high white collar workers who pay high rents and are also, uh, they have high income and not for the communities that were most disadvantaged. So a few solutions that exist in terms of policy <clears throat> Sorry. One is transit oriented development, where we can think of developing these instead in a different way where we we take clusters of, of our neighborhoods where development is focused on housing, business, amenities, and transit together in small clusters. So people don't need to travel much further away. And at, because of that, you can have lots of centers of of mobility and business activity. And instead of making it a central business district, you have multiple business districts in a city. Then other solutions focus on smart mobility options like Uber, et cetera. And recently micro mobility options that are less neoliberal in nature, more run by government organizations um, to try and address the gap between public transit and vulnerable communities and provide solutions of micro, uh, micro transit that are also on demand in nature. So when we reflect back on the urban governance framework that we discussed at the beginning, which is policies are neoliberal, disintegrated and utilitarian. If we focus on these kinds of solutions where we, we get smart infrastructure, smart mobility, micro mobility, we have to account for the social spatial implications and the temporal implications of these kinds of policy choices. So people who don't use these kinds of data infrastructure are not in the data. So we can never know whether they need these things or not, or even if they're going to use it. This is also related to ideas of latent demand in transportation. Then those who cannot afford it will not use it. So they will still be left behind anyway, because 
the market doesn't take care of vulnerable people. Uh, those who are displaced over long term, something that is very difficult to track, but also very important to track is uh, gentrification. So when these kinds of solutions come into play, certain neighborhoods might become more interesting or more um, attractive for certain communities. Again, mostly for white collar workers who, who have high income and pay, want to pay high rent. And so housing markets can shift and people might be displaced. And then these solutions actually don't affect people who they were meant for at the beginning, whether it's proper transit systems or smart transit systems uh, or something else. So these are very important things to consider when we are thinking about uh, developing smart solutions or any kind of solutions in a city when we are trying to design cities at scale. So to summarize this kind of uh, this topic, the challenges and the main findings that we've noticed are threefold. There are urban interventions, ongoing urban interventions in cities. Cities are always in transformation because whether it's regular development or a reactive development to address a problem of any stressor in city, these can lead to maladaptation due to short term fragmented thinking. And a lot of this billion dollar infrastructure or billion euro infrastructure cannot be rolled back, often cannot be rolled back. So once developed, we have to live with the consequences for sometimes decades. Then on the other side, unequal access to important areas is spatial and associated with income and ethnicity. So interventions should be aware of already existing inequalities. They are not right now. So that's something to consider. And finally, all the impact of climate change or other kinds of stressors on cities also are not aware of existing inequalities because they just happen on their own. And the impact is disproportionate on certain socioeconomic demographics, like the heat waves or climate change impacts often affect the poor and the elderly a lot more than other folks in, in a city, even if they are living in, in better regions or better neighborhoods. So how do we account for that when thinking about uh, urban interventions? So all of these questions led us to thinking about accessibility in this particular case, not as a physical indicator, not just as mapping where is education, jobs, healthcare, energy, et cetera, but thinking also what social outcomes can those indicators of access bring for these communities? So can they lead to better social outcomes? And if not, then it's, it doesn't really matter whether you have access to something. If it doesn't bring you the opportunities that you need to get out or to have an upward mobility, then that indicator is useless uh, in terms of reducing inequalities. So we started thinking in the direction of composite indicators of access for development of the city as a whole. And that leads me to the third part of, of my talk, which is a social spatial framework that we are now working on for integrated planning and policy uh, that is aware of inequalities and that focuses on, on keeping policies in an integrated framework as opposed to a disintegrated one. This is something that I've been developing with uh, my postdoc, Juliana Gonsalves, who's now moving to uh, another faculty, architecture in TU Duft as an assistant professor. So the work is continuing and thankfully for a longer time in the future. The key th three key things that we learned from our projects before, integration is important, space is important, and sociodemographics is important to look at. So we are developing social spatial framework to support this integrated uh, ways of urban design planning and policy. So what is our approach? Um, the first thing is cities are always going to transform, whether it's through an external impact of different things, climate, um, moving populations, et cetera, or is it through policy and, and practice in the city itself? So what's important? The first thing is to understand complexity understanding complexity of urban spaces through different kinds of tools and what the space and time dynamics of, of these relational subsystems of cities are. The second is to have a framework of identifying the impact. So we borrow from social impact assessment in identifying, managing and monitoring impacts caused by these interventions over time. It's not just enough to, to unroll a policy and then forget about it. There has to be a system in place to monitor the impacts um, and assess whether they are working or not for the communities that they are intended for. The third one is participation. We are uh, fans of public participation and, and we'd like to engage citizen in decision and gain insights into real inequalities and so not just saying this is what we perceive as inequalities or any other problem in a city, but do they actually also perceive this as inequality? 
and do they perceive other kinds of solutions that might be more beneficial for them as opposed to what we want to impose on them as uh, public policy makers and i think this is also important thinking about whether it's an ai based approach or not in the future whether smart mobility options or or something else that relates to energy or or another domain is to have public also work together with policymakers to understand the consequences of the models that we use to assess these these kinds of problems in cities and how to move forward together um, so we identify what's important and then we use that to build our, our social spatial framework how do we do that we do that in three steps the first is to analyze the vulnerabilities and risks which is the situation as is currently the second is to think about inequality aware or integrated policy design and planning options for addressing these problems the third is to monitor and follow up. So the first is something we do with research. The third is something we do with frameworks and systems in place, and we should know what kind of things to monitor. The second is something that policymakers have to do, designers, architects, but it's also good to connect that with the first one so that they are aware of these inequalities and lead it to the third one where they are, uh, they understand we are designing something, but we should also have uh, scope for ma managing the indicators and the measurements over time for monitoring. So the first step, developing a social spatial framework of vulnerability and risks. I already talked about this extensively. Vulnerability in access was measured. We understood how that plays out in, in space and what that might be related to. But it's also important to have a more holistic assessment because we saw that indicators are not just enough. We also need to understand whether these indicators bring better social outcomes for people. So as I said before, we are borrowing from social sciences, social spatial impact assessment literature. And there are seven things that are identified as very important for measuring social impacts of any kind of decision-making is institutional political impacts, cultural, gender relations, economic, quality of the built environment, community spaces, and health and well-being. Um, so what? how should we design spaces so that data that we collect from monitoring it over the long term should fit into these boxes? And then we can assess the multidimensional nature of change in inequalities over time for specific communities. Uh, the second is, a, is more policy related and design related, but still I will talk a little bit about it is how do we design these systems when we are aware of inequalities? So a couple of examples and bullet points to consider is there has to be alternative business districts so that people have more spaces to diversify and, and communicate with each other and change or exchange knowledge. New transit development should also associate with building these alternative districts. It shouldn't be center and outward always because cities are also sprawling and growing. Uh, policy should be equity and justice aware as we discussed. And of course, subsidies shouldn't be utilitarian in nature. When there's subsidies, for example, for renovation policies or um, whether it's transit policies or uh, green roofs or nature-based solutions, they need to focus on um, what are the inequalities that already exist, not just among people, but also the built environment. Uh, especially when it comes to, to high energy bills that a lot of folks are paying because their built environment is not okay. And what kind of social networks these communities are embedded in, where they can exchange knowledge and grow from that knowledge and get the community support that they need to, to come out of poverty or inequality. And the third one is monitoring and follow up. So when we talk about monitoring and follow up, how do we build these systems that can include or engage citizens? Um, here, we talk about something that we are building in the future, Citizen Voice. It's a public participation tool uh, that we intend to build such that we can also develop a set of guidelines for people to use it. It should be open source and freely available for everyone. This example that I will talk about in a second is collaboration with the Hamburg City University um, called Hafen City University in Hamburg, where they developed a tool called DIPAS uh, to integrate public participation into policy making or city monitoring dashboards. So the, the map is from Hamburg, where we assume that people are able to contribute with their thoughts about public policy projects and what that means for, for them in the future. 
So that brings me to the last part of the talk, uh, which will be a quick one, example of public value conflicts. Uh, this project, as I said, was done in collaboration with the uh, university in Hamburg. Uh, the platform is called DPAS, public participation um, through data. And this is called Cities for Citizens, where we identify public value conflicts in urban regions. So normally the theory of public participation states that, um, well, not the theory necessarily of public participation, but theory of development in cities. And it states that there, are, there could be three kinds of conflicts when we're thinking about equity, economy, and ecology. On the left side, there could be three kinds of conflicts, either development conflict, because equity and ecology lead to a conflict in development. Do you maintain equity? Do you focus on the ecology or the environment around you? The property conflict is growing economy or maintaining equity. And the resource conflict is keep using more to develop and grow economically, then we need to take more resources from ecology. So there are different kinds of conflicts that arise in public space or urban spaces. The idea here was to center the discussion on people and not just on places. So when we add, uh, well, these authors, Gottschalk et al, they added a fourth, element to this called the livability and adding livability means now we're centering our discussion on people and their experiences and then three more conflicts emerge one is the gentrification conflict equity and livability lead to uh, displacement of of communities often we see that in our own search for housing or or better housing um, around then the other conflict is about livability and ecology where green space conflicts can occur. And the third one about economy and ecology, uh, sorry, economy and livability where the growth management conflict can occur. How do we manage growth as we want to have better livability for our communities? So using this theory, we thought let's try and center our public space projects in cities today in 2020, uh, 21, 22, in all of these conflicts and see whether the citizens actually agree with this or are they able to find resolution in developing more and more for the better in their cities. So we used a mixed methods approach um, in Hamburg, identifying spatial public value conflicts by leveraging large scale qualitative geolocated participatory data. We are not using Twitter here or any other kind of platforms of social media. This is specifically focused on collecting comments and thoughts from citizens towards public policy projects and development projects in the city of Hamburg. So they, the platform is essentially locked to just people in Hamburg. And our research flow was look at all the geolocated citizen comments in this platform in the city of Hamburg. They are spatially uh, located. So we extract uh, public values. In this methodology, we extract their comments that are laid, laden with values that they believe in, whether it's uh, ecological, sustainability, resilience, equity, green space, whatever kind of value that they are coming up with bottom up. And then there's some kind of spatial conflict identification because in the same regions where projects are um, proposed by the policymakers, we can see that people's values are arising because of their comments and those values are not in sync. So some folks might want better, bigger, buildings for parking their cars and others might want bikes and, and public transit. And those values are in contrast with each other. So some folks might want green space, others might want more development, more business districts and, and malls. And so those values are also in conflict with each other. And our goal was how can we center these discussions on the map, use the spatial element, use some quantitative information indicators for the policymakers now to reflect back. Why do they think? these conflicts are arising. Is that because of this, the nature of the space itself or something else? Um, and there could be a variety of reasons. And so in this project, through this flow, we were able to, to get information from citizens in a, um, in a tool like the Citizen Voice, where people could voice their opinions about conflicts. And the policymakers could use that discussion to either update their policy or have a discussion with citizens later on to try and resolve these conflicts or a third kind of option where participation is not just tokenized, where, hey, you come to, uh, to the city hall and you see what we're developing, uh, you eat something, you drink something, you chat and you go home and we develop it anyway, or you come to city hall with a proper uh, agenda where we have now discussed what the conflicts are and we can try and find resolution through different participatory planning approaches. 
So this helped policymakers quite a bit in understanding, okay, some conflicts are going to be there anyway, and we just have to deal with them and figure out a different way of, of developing. And some uh, are not necessary anymore because the citizens don't want it. And it's clear that they don't want it. So let's move on and think of a different way of developing in this region with citizens and communities perhaps. So anyway, long story short, I would like to recap uh, the social spatial framework and what we've learned so far. We are developing this framework to support integrated urban design planning and policy. There are three steps. One is identification of the vulnerabilities and risks, which I showed through the example of inequalities and how it's segregated around the world. Second is about actually then designing, planning and, and developing policies that address those concerns or problems. Uh, we haven't talked about this example of urbanization or the impact of Airbnb and gentrification in Amsterdam, but I'm just placing it there because that's something we do in that uh, part. And the third is monitoring and follow up, uh, and especially with and through citizen communities and not just uh, through sensor based networks and, and systems is having actual citizen participation with some uh, context based understanding of the, the situations. So that's the third project about citizen participation. Our goals that we have been and trying to, and hopefully in the future, uh, satisfy or reach is moving towards a more integrated decision-making where policies consider these relationships and complexities in a system, not just among infrastructure, but also among communities, what kind of conflicts arise and how can we resolve them and so on. The second is that one solution doesn't fit all. So instead of focusing on utilitarian approaches. This is one of the famous approaches by Amartya Sen of the capabilities approach where uh, benefit is accrued by being aware of existing inequalities and what those capability, what those resources can actually bring in terms of capabilities and opportunities for the communities. And finally, development shouldn't be neoliberal always, but tailored to the needs of the communities and aware of the needs of all communities, not just one is that shifting away from neoliberal to social and communal policies where new and small forms of investment attract more diverse workers, not just white color workers who bring in varied skills and need community support because all of those skills are also necessary for sustaining a healthy, thriving city for the future. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge that a lot of the work here has been done not just by me, but also these wonderful folks. Um, probably you know some of them, probably you don't. Um, so these people have helped a lot in building these ideas and, and results and analysis. And now they are doing different things uh, in different places. They've moved on from CUSP, most of them, but we still collaborate quite a bit. But it's not just these people. Our ideas are always shaped and co-developed and enriched by the thinking that others also bring at CUSP. So there are these people and, and many more that I cannot place here. But um, yeah, so it's not just me. And there's a lot of these people who've helped us in the past. Um, last thread of information. So our Center for Open Science and Policy is we have one mission, which is to focus on affecting change in urban planning and policy. And our goal is to have a more equitable and sustainable transformation in cities because cities are going to forever trans transform, but can we shape that in a manner that it's thriving for all communities and, and people. And so if you're interested in chatting later now or any other time, please feel free to get my email or the website. Uh, happy also to talk on Twitter. Uh, and there's a barcode there for you to get to the website as well. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Trivik. I think that was a very exciting and intriguing talk. Um, and I think the vision you have here is a grand one and a noble one in that. So thanks a lot for sharing some of these very interesting ideas. Um, as I said earlier on, a large part of our group, unfortunately, today happens to be uh, either at a conference or um, at another event. But that uh, won't leave me without uh, bringing up a couple of uh, questions and uh, trying to discuss how we can move forward uh, thanks to some of these ideas that you brought to the table. Um, one of the questions that occurred to me while you, know, you were sharing some of these ideas was how exactly can we go about, uh, well, quantifying and understanding the value of amenities for different people in an urban space? I can imagine that there's a fair amount of subjectivity that's involved in there. Um, and you, you walked us through how you model this, and there was this element of 
weighting each of these amenities. And I was curious as to uh, how exactly one can go about doing this. Vivek, are you still with us? Yeah, do you still hear me? Yes, you're back now. Okay. I'll see you there for a second, I think, yeah. I was just trying to to get back to the slide, but I, I don't know what happened. So I'll just no worries. Again. let me get you back there and sure. discuss your question. So thanks for that question. That's very relevant to what we did. And, and I think also for the future of how, how to do these things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think your question was, if I summarize, we are quantifying these weights, um, well, we are subjectively deciding these weights and giving our own interpretation, but how can we do that also in the future and quantify them? Because different people have different values towards what matters to them the most. Right. right. Um, so yeah, I'll tell you about how we did that and why, and then maybe we can discuss a little bit what could be the future of doing this. So we used a concept called Maslow's hierarchy, which is um, just this, this moral outlook towards society and, and a philosophical debate about what is more important. And it's a pyramid, basically, of different needs of, of humans. So I think the first one is the safety and security. The second is physiological and the third is social needs. So anything to do with safety and security is, is the most important. Uh, the second is the physiological needs and then third is the social needs. And, and then there are others as well that have been uh, developed on top of this pyramid in the past. So we considered that infrastructure that falls under the first or the second belt is the most important. So we might give it a score of 0.2 or 0.3. And then there are three or four kinds of infrastructure there. And the infrastructure that falls in our social needs, for example, restaurants, community space, and so on, might be uh, the least relevant in Maslow's hierarchy. So we give that a score of 0.1 or 0 0.05 and so on. Now, this is also very subjective because Maslow and people working on these kinds of things never said infrastructure should be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. Um, so we just did something within our group. We, the, the co-authors of this work, we just established how we will ca characterize each of the infrastructure that we find on the open source data sets into one of these seven categories. So even here, these, these let me go back. These categories of basic amenities is seven. This is also subjective interpretation. In the data set, these, there are about 16 or 25 categories. I don't remember to be precise, but we take all of those uh, and we put them in, in one of these categories, like pharmacy or hospitals are in health and well-being. And then we say, now we go to the next step where we situate these into the Maslow's hierarchy. And each of us does it separately. And then we come together and reconcile whether we've done the same things, why, why not, and can we find a resolution? That was a more subjective process. Uh, and I can imagine different teams might lead to different outcomes. So one of the things to do, I think, in the future is to run this kind of analysis for different sets of weights for your amenities and see whether inequality substantially change. The other thing is, to also just look at the fact that these inequalities are multidimensional. So do we really need to measure them together as one indicator or should we separate them? As I showed in the social science literature, there are seven kinds of impacts that we are assessing. So can we break down this inequality into different sets of impacts and then measure them separately and see how they relate to each other, whether they're cumulative, whether they're interconnected and so on. Uh, and so that is something that we are doing now and there we don't need the weights. The third thing I think is related to your question also, which is how do we quantify that if we need to uh, in the future? And I think the best way would be to use something like citizen voice or citizen participation tools where when we are focusing on just one community, uh, because oftentimes policy is focused on one community and not taking into account the whole city. Now, if we want to help this community, then let's create a survey that is map-based because space is important. It's important to situate these experiences in a spatial manner and have our questions, our information collection processes tailored to identifying what is more important for these people. 
because in this community it might be important to have a public transit system not a restaurant whereas in another public transit already exists or they don't care because they have their personal cars um, and so they care more about community space or green space or restaurants and so on and so i asking the community itself makes uh, a good case for uh, having well-formed weights for these kinds of things and i think that's also making a good case for citizen engagement in the future that makes a lot of sense yeah thanks um something else that i'd love to discuss with you uh, you know you sort of touched upon it here towards the end where you said you know one way to uh, dive into the future is to try and engage citizens i was wondering how exactly one could potentially think of ways to scale up public participation in initiatives such as these and you know also i, I can imagine that uh, a large part of the vision that you've charted out here for uh, with respect to the socio spatial framework that you spoke about might also require direct participation of citizens right and might completely rely in some cases on uh, such scaled participation of citizens are there ways that we can try to engage citizens what what exactly uh, can one do to try and ensure that there's sustainable participation from citizens yeah very interesting question i think that's that's the question that we are asking ourselves for research for the next few years in citizen participation is exactly that uh, actually so it's good that you bring it up and um the first thing that i've learned through some other people that we've invited and spoken to about their citizen participation work is is to develop trust the first thing is to build trust with their communities so often researchers and policy makers in the west go with the mindset this is the problem this is the survey give us this data and then we'll fix everything and i think there the participation is not sustainable um so you will probably see people who who want to say something volunteer bias might come into play selection bias might come into play uh, and other kinds of biases that we have um would stop communities from joining such participation efforts so a researcher that we invited recently told us that one has to embed in the community and talk to the right people who are leaders of the community who are seen as leaders of the community to develop trust with them first and then it's important secondly i think to again this is coming from other people in the field who've who've taught us is to develop your problem statement and develop your research methods together with the community when you do that the trust comes naturally and then um, it's the data collection will be enriched by participation in various forms and then it's also the data that you need to actually solve the problem because the community agrees that this is the problem often problems have different nuances so sometimes it might be taken wrongly or might not even solve things because we are getting the wrong indicators from people right so it's i think it's just build trust and then develop methods problem statement and forms of data collection together and also analyze together that's another thing that people are this to analyze these kinds of data sets together with the community and i think fourthly uh which i know less about i think juliana can speak more to that uh who i'm working with on these topics is there are participatory forms of actually conducting workshops within communities so we i go in as a data person as a modeling person but there are people who are going in as a person who's running the workshop with the community how do you do that from start to end for the 2 hours or 3 hours that you're there how do you engage people to work together to come up with these kinds of problems and methods and data collection processes and then how do you roll this out into the community and how do you do that actually on the ground with the people not while we are in the lab or working on our computers so it's important to also take that into account um and that again does not answer your question wholly i, I imagine is question was related to scaling this up to the city i myself have that question um so scaling up would require basically doing the same thing for every community and doing the exact same thing for every community because in scaling up we cannot do all of these tailored things for every specific person or community so 
let's create a foundation of a questionnaire or things that we need from everybody in the whole city or urban space or region, and then work with partners who can go in there to do the same practices specific to that community. I think that's probably the way to scale up, something that we have to find out in the future. Thanks a lot for that answer. Um, okay, someone's ringing my bell, just give me a sure. second. Go for it, no worries. Sorry, uh, I think that's just part of the work practices now in 2022. Uh, it's perfectly fine. And thanks to the really great editing technology we have these days, I think we can snip that one out uh, for the many followers who will follow up on this uh, chat. So Rick, you've been very gracious with your time. If you don't mind, I, I'd love to try and pick your brain one with one last question that spans the very exciting socio-spatial framework that you've presented today. Do you have another minute to take one final question? Yeah, of course. Sure, awesome. Yeah, so I've been thinking about potential opportunities that might interest a large part of our TAF community as well with respect, with respect to trying to identify and understand what exactly can be scaled up and what could be the potential role of AI in helping humans collaborate um, and benefit from the powers that AI can bring to the table, right? So I, for one, am not a believer in throwing AI at complex problems and hoping that it can contribute. But I wonder whether, you know, through your experience and exposure, you've identified certain problems where, you know, you thought, well, you know, potentially AI can play a role over here and helping aid experts in one way, shape or form or another. I was just wondering how this would fit across the uh, landscape of the framework you spoke about today. Yeah, very good question. So I think, AI is helpful. It's very helpful. I use it every day in my research. It's, it's of course, got negative connotations because of all the other politics around it. Um, and one must use it judiciously and smartly. But just starting from the example here, we've used AI before. The most commonly used form of AI, machine learning, is something that is the backbone of this project, for instance a project of public value identification and conflict of public values. So here, there's thousands of citizens who are giving comments on public projects. And out of all of that noise, we don't expect somebody to, to read all of these thousand people's comments, which might be up to 20,000 or 10,000 or whatever. So what do we do? We use techniques that are related, that are in machine learning that are related to uh, identifying uh, sentiment analysis, topic modeling, identifying what kind of things people are talking about. Can we cluster those topics? Identify commonalities among certain communities, identify commonalities and differences among people, whether they are positive or negative about these kinds of things and what their emotions are behind these values. And then using a mixed methods approach, we can aid planners to get this important information, which is not necessarily anymore about everything that people have said, but the most important things, identify what are the commonalities and differences, and then subjectively identify what are the values that are associated with these commonalities or differences. And those values don't come out of the algorithms, they come out of people's ability to spot those, those values. So I believe it's very important to use these kinds of things to try and narrow down your input data into the elements that are most important for you and then combine that with our our thinking abilities critical thinking and insight into various topics and domains to put that together and say hey okay we have found out this important information and now we know these values matter to us in the context of this example uh, and now we can map that on each other and then we understand what the conflicts are. Right? How should we identify them is a separate question. How, how should we resolve them is the next question. But those AI-based approaches have helped us get this far. If they were not present, then I think we would not be able to get to a point where we can read all of these 30,000 comments and then say, these are the values. But through that, we've actually, in this project particularly, we are publishing this soon, we were able to uh, enrich the theory of this prism 
that we showed here. So mm. what we found is that we don't have a prism in civil life, life today. We have something of spheres that are more three-dimensional in nature and are very different for different cities, communities, and spatial projects that are planned in a city. So we are using data to drive the theory instead of using theory to say, these are the conflicts that exist. We are using the data from the people and the communities to say, this is a new form of conflict map that exists for you. And now planners have to be cognizant of that and then deal with it so that communities are included and also thrive in the future. So it's very important for this example. I think just to maybe wrap up that question for the future, also, these kinds of approaches provide a lot of insight. And it has, in my opinion, it has to be mixed methods. We, we can get all of this information to be tailored through machine learning and other AI approaches to get exactly the right amount of detail that we need. And then there has to be subjective interpretation and uh, inclusion of different stakeholders who have competing priorities to come and try and make sense of that information. As opposed to like the very famous Tuxla affair in, in the Netherlands, the child scandal benefit that happened, which was more like algorithms, output, let's do it and forget what the impact is and never acknowledge it or accept it. And we still continue to do it, uh, although in different ways. I think the approach is always to have the human in the loop and not just one human, but a set of humans who can come together and try and infer this insight because there's competing priorities and then to deal with them. Yeah. Thanks a lot for engaging with that, Vivek. Uh, one last shout out to any potential questions from uh, Pida, Evelyn, and Dimitra who are here with us. If not, let's thank Trivik once again for being so generous with this time and for joining us today. Thank you so much, Trivik, for sharing these wonderful ideas with us. And it was a pleasure, pleasure listening in to you. And I do hope uh, that you know you can go a long way towards realizing many of these grand visions that you shared with us. I, for one, am certainly going to keep an eye open uh, and perhaps reach out to collaborate on some of these. I can certainly resonate with uh, some of the ideas you spoke about with respect to engaging citizens at scale and uh, what one could potentially explore while trying to incentivize participation and sustain it as well over time. So those were some very interesting ideas that um, I think I'd love to dive in as we uh, move towards a future that we'd all like to live in. So thank you so much, uh, Travik. It was a pleasure having you here and I can't wait to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Ujwal. Yeah, the sentiments are echoed here as well. I'm very happy to be here and hopefully this will be useful for the community and being a part of the community, of course, and thanks to our three um, folks here who are attending the presentation. I hope more people can see it. Um, but definitely would be very open to discussing more and collaborating more in the future, uh, as we've also discussed prior to this event. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tarek. And we, we will be sharing uh, details about, you know, people who are circling back and watching this. These are stats that we keep continuously. Uh, so rest assured, there will be uh, quite a few people who will tune into this and benefit from it. So thank you once again. Uh, it was lovely having you here and I, I look forward to having you here again, perhaps in the future. Thanks everyone. Thank you for being here with us. This is the Academic Fringe Festival and I'm Rachel Kadraju. See you around soon. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. See you everyone.